Hello, I'm Kent Sangster, the Artistic Director and Producer of the TD Edmonton International Jazz Festival. Today, we are featuring a performance by Kendrick Scott. Kendrick Scott is an internationally renowned American drummer, composer, who is one of the most in-demand musicians in the world of jazz. In addition to supporting numerous jazz masters as their drummer of choice, Kendrick leads his own band called Oracle, having released four notable recordings for Blue Note Records. We hope you enjoy this online experience. Thank you for tuning in.
Today we're very, very fortunate to have Kendrick Scott um, share some wonderful music with us today. Kendrick, uh, please tell us a little bit about what we just were presented with. Well, uh, what you just heard was, um, first of all, just the open solo that I played, um, just kind of ruminating on my time in this uh, quarantine, and, and that was called Lockdown. And, um, and after that piece, I, I played uh, one of my songs off of my uh, first record on Blue Note Records that was called We Are the Drum. And uh, the third uh, piece that, that was kind of at the end of that uh, was just, uh, just uh, a meditation for Breonna Taylor. Okay. Um, it's an untitled piece. Okay. Um, well, I, I have to say that it, uh, when it started and I was um, with the solo offering, I mean, I'm a saxophone player, so I'm, I'm kind of mesmerized by drums trying to figure out you know, just kind of some, you know, some of the, you know, s subtle nuances of, of the drum set. And I have to say that the, the sonic sound of your drums is fantastic. And I just, I really oh, appreciate, thank you. yeah, I really appreciate the subtleties and nuances there. And then the second piece really caught my attention to ask you a little bit about your compositional approach, how you go about creating such wonderful sounds. What's your process as a drummer? How do you compose? Uh, well, mainly, uh, I think of my compositional process as, as um, Dali would think of, of painting. There's a beautiful Dali painting called uh, The Reflection of Elephants. And if you look at the uh, painting, there's some elephants and uh, they're going up to the water to get, uh, to get some water. And as you look, their trunks are reflected in the water. And in the water, they look like swans. And that, to me, that visual, it's a visual representation of finding an idea and finding how that idea reflects throughout many different, uh, uh, reflecting it off of a wall, off of the water, off of the sky, whatever it means. Just taking something simple. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Terrence Blanchard taught me one of the most beautiful things um, in music is just to realize the simple things that are the most beautiful. Dun, 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 Four notes. It can become a whole, you know, a whole, a whole symphony. And I try to do that. I mainly come up with my songs by singing. I think my voice is my second best thing that I have, but I would never put my voice out there as a singer but I think I try to sing through my drums mm -hmm. and uh, that's the way I create my uh, melodies. And then I go on to harmonize those melodies. And actually the piece that you heard, We Are The Drum is one of the most rhythmic songs that I've, I've ever written as far as changing meter and changing uh, 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 pulses and all of those type of things. I really usually don't write like that. That was uh, something very in a particular moment. And I hope I can do more of that. But um, usually my songs are just usually hummable melodies that, in which I uh, uh, create dense, dense harmonies uh, around them. I mainly got that from Wayne Shorter, uh, who was one of my idols, who was one of Terrence Blanchard's idols. So right. uh, mainly right. all, of my, <laughs> all of my compositional stuff I got from my time with Terrence Blanchard. And he influenced me a lot. Uh, he taught me uh, about um, uh, this method. If I could, I would tell you. And uh, if you think about that sentence, it's uh, it's uh, you can see you can hear each of the words individually. And he said, OK, well, tell me um, something about that sentence. Give me uh, um, say say those words in this. Use those same words in another sentence. And. Uh, I say, well, I could tell you if I would, I could tell you if I could tell you, tell you, you know, and he was like, that's incredible. So what I also want you to think about is punctuation, right? A question right. mark, a, um, uh, an exclamation point, a period, a comma. Also think about how each of those uh, words could have a different meaning. Could tell, tell you. Could you tell, tell, you know what I mean? It's like, whoa, 
oh, your, your mind starts expanding and starts seeing things in a different light, just as Dali saw the elephants as swans. Do you know what I mean? So. Right. And so then with the different punctuation is that then I get from that, then that's going to give you more space and space in terms of the musical phrase. Yes, definitely right. more space right. and more direction, more direction in, in what the phrase feels like. Is the phrase going up? Is, is right. the question going up and the answer going down? <laughs> or are you trying to switch them? You know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. um, and that's, to me, that connected with me because I was so scared of trying to write music. And I'm still scared of trying to write music um, as I'm learning it because... I have those feelings inside of me as a drummer. Mm -hmm. So as I'm playing the drums and I hit a cymbal, I know what's going to make the cymbal go up. That means if I hit the bow of the cymbal, which is the, the, the edge part with the, with the shoulder of my stick, I know that the sound is going to go up. But if I hit the edge, it's going to make you feel like this, right? You know, so each time I hit a cymbal, I have a, a view of what feeling I want to get. And I'm not thinking about that as I'm doing that. I spent the time to sit down and hit, you know, have an intimate knowledge of my specific right. symbols, you know what I mean? Right. So um, with that uh, intimate knowledge, I use that in the moment. And I'm trying to get there with composition, but it's, it's, it's a whole different, <laughs> it's a whole different animal. So, you know, hopefully I'm trying to build on that and uh, get better. Well, I compose a fair amount of music myself, and I and I teach it, and I love that analogy that you just gave us because there's one thing from the technical side of things with a theme or a motif, but then when you're yeah. trying to relate it to speech and and dialogue and communication, that sure. that that actually it makes a whole lot of sense. And thank you for that because um, I'm going to try to think about that a little bit more myself. Um. Could you could we talk just a little bit about your band Oracle and like the sure. origins of that? Because that you know I'm a big fan of the band, the instrumentation. But I'll let you explain to our viewers what what's that all about. Well, for me, the name of the band comes directly from Art Blakey's Jazz Messages. You know when um, you know uh, as I was learning about Art Blakey, he said we create music to wash away the dust of everyday life, right. and um, you know. In, in my world, I was watching The Matrix. And every time Neo went to The Matrix for an answer, she would give him questions. And I always thought that Socratic type of uh, thinking was always beautiful because it was always inward. Um, instead of telling you what something is, what is the question? What is the question we need to ask ourselves in order to be better, in order to come to the conclusions ourselves. So to me, that's what Oracle was about, is a band that um, creates questions, you know, sends, uh, sends the listener into, uh, hopefully into a mode in which they can reflect on life in a different way. Um, and the people that I chose are very dear to me. Uh, my friend, Mike Moreno, we have been knowing each other since, uh, 1994, we went to high school together. Uh, we went to high school with Robert Glasper and uh, Walter Smith and Mark Kelly and all and Beyonce, all these great wow. musicians and artists Incredible. all went to our high school. And uh, so me and Mike have had a strong connection. He's one of the first uh, people to really share with me, uh, share his music with me. And I grew a lot from... Um, uh, uh, the music that he shared with me really influenced me into the sound that I wanted to get because he was always ahead of all of us as far as hearing music and hearing sounds that were um, uh, modern sounds, but that were also uh, sounds from the masters who had come before all of the modern stuff we were listening to. So I would always uh, take his CDs, and I still remember to this day, him and Walter, I, I used some of their CDs, and I managed to scratch one or two. And they were like, I'm never letting you borrow a CD again. That was when we were, that was when we were carrying around this, the, uh, yeah. you know, the case yes, logics and all of that. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, he, yeah, yeah, he's still mad at me to this day. But 
Mike's sound in particular plays a certain role in the band. He has a certain space that he occupies in the band that really, um, um, it has a certain power and a certain transparency that I love and uh, that I really um, came to love through my listening and many different uh, guitarists and, and sounds uh, in, in some of my favorite bands. And Mike fits per per perfectly in that place of, of he's, he's like the clouds and, and then they come in and they, they not as far as like cloud cover where it's like, oh, you're not letting the sun shine through, but there's a transparency right. In what he does, uh, and that's very beautiful. Uh, Taylor Ixty, I always tell pe people that um, Taylor is actually the engine of the band because his attention uh, to detail and his the way he comps and the way he uh, plays rhythm is actually uh, what is driving the band. Um, Taylor's um, his melodic sense is otherworldly and his sense of design is uh, uh, very, very unique. If you're around Taylor for any amount of time, you can see how his mind works, how he formulates things and how he puts them together. Uh, it's so funny, sometimes we're in rehearsal and I'm like, okay, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. And Taylor's like, hold, 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 wait, 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 wait. He's like, okay, so when we get here, where are we? Ah, oh, okay, okay. And then he sees the design, and then he plays into that design. And the thing about that is, it's not that he's not malleable to just play whatever, because if you force something on him, he's going to jump right into it and do it. But it's beautiful that he is, um, he is uh, somebody who pays close attention to uh, what are we going after? What are we trying to say when we go right. from this part of the music to this part of the music? And I really cherish that and uh, in his playing. Uh, uh, for me, Joe Sanders is kind of the opposite of that, which is what I love. Because Joe is, to me, he's the renegade of the band. He's the one that's going to challenge me, that's going to make sure I'm not getting complacent <laughs> in where I am. He's okay. like, OK, we usually go here, but we're going somewhere else. And I'm like, wait, where, where are we going? Like, we're going this way. We're going to walk. We're gonna walk two miles that way and then come back. We're gonna come back, but we're gonna go two miles that way today. And you need that, you need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. So, you know, I mean, I put these personalities together and I, I feel like um, that's the beauty of my band is if you see us sitting together and just talking and you just realize the different personalities, how everybody works, then you put the music together. You're like, oh, wow, okay, I see how that works. and. Um, Joe is always providing a, a strong foundation. He's uh, very intuitive in when to play and when not to play. And uh, for me, that opens me up a lot because it lets me know that I don't have to say everything that I'm hearing. You know, it's like we have two ears and one mouth. So we listen twice as hard. And I feel like Joe is always listening to everything that we're doing. And sometimes he's like, you know what? I don't have anything to comment on that. And sometimes he's like, what? And then he gives us the, you know, the, the biggest, uh, most pertinent comments. And uh, the foundation he lays is like nobody else. Um, John Ellis is, uh, what can I say about John? John is uh, somebody that has provided, <laughs> John provided me my first gig in New York when I moved to New York. Nice. And he's like, come play with me. So he, him, and he was playing and he hired Mike, actually. And that was my entree into playing in New York. And uh, we've had a, a strong connection, uh, you know, I'm from Houston, Texas. And, um, and John used to be in uh, New Orleans. And in his time in New Orleans, he, um, he, he really developed something that I think is very unique. Um, in how he, his approach, even to the most modern music is still a soulful approach. And I really appreciate that, that we can go in many different uh, 
uh, many different directions, but they also ha have a central focus in how he's uh, approaching um, playing the blues, the blues as a feeling, not just right. as a song form. Um, but um, that's something that I appreciate from Wayne Shorter when I hear Wayne Shorter. And I hear the same thing in John. It's completely different. But I hear the same feeling when he approaches uh, playing something on the saxophone, uh, on the bass clarinet, and even on the last record, he played flute. Uh, and he plays many different instruments and, and can achieve uh, that feeling. And that's one of, the, one of the reasons why I have John in the band. He's also a beautiful human being. So nice. that's the whole band. Did I talk about each of them? Yeah, I did. That's yeah, horrible. Did. And me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't forget yourself. So one question about that. Um, I've often wondered about this with some um, people who are very busy side musicians for other artists and you're very you know you're very busy with that how do you manage the time to push forward with your own projects yeah well that was interesting because it takes me back to terrence blanchard's uh back to terrence blanchard and the beginnings of what he told me in 2003 he said you know what i said i don't, I don't think i would ever get a band or you know do anything or make a record or anything like that and he said you know what it's about a body of work. Everything we do in our life is about a body of work, not just one record in particular, not this one show, not this one song. He says, you need to, even if you're not going on, uh, going out there on your own as a band leader and you're gonna do only your band, you need to start uh, creating music and creating works so that you can build on that. And what I realize now is that I'm older is that if you watch, Terrence Blanchard um, creates and he fosters band leaders. And uh, right. if you look now, all of us who were in Terrence Blanchard's band from two, 2000, uh, I don't know when I joined the band, 2003. So I was in the band for 11 years, but most of us have been on Blue Note Records. Me, right. Derek Hodge, Aaron Parks, and Lionel Lewicke. And um, it's incredible that he um, has taken the time to instill in us the mindset of a leader, even while you're in the band. And so um, I feel like that's what started me off thinking and, have, and having confidence enough to be like, you know what, I guess I should just make it. It's not the greatest thing ever. You know, I, I still remember making my first record and I did a couple of different sessions. And the first song I was like, okay, I'm gonna play Latin, I'm gonna play this, I'm gonna play that, I'm gonna play this. And of course the record was all over the place and it didn't have any vibe to it. And um, all of a sudden I surrendered and, and sometime later I said, you know what, let's go back and do it again. And I did some things in which the, half, the other half of the record I, I trashed and I was like, okay, I'm going to keep this. And it just flowed and it just real. I just made me realize you can't do everything you want to do all at once because it's about the body of work. And so as I've continued to just play and get to play with the masters, um, uh, actually I was with uh, Ambrose back in Musery and he, he was, he says something in particular that I've been thinking about a lot and I tell my students a lot. It's like this uh, beautiful triangle. It's like you're at the top of the triangle. You want to work on yourself and build all of your um, uh, work and build the body of work. On the corners, you have your homies, the, your, your peers and who you play with. And on the other corner are your heroes. And to me, that has been my, uh, my, uh, um, my focus. Uh, to always just try to keep some music coming out of my own. But I mean, when Charles Lloyd calls, I'm there. If Herbie calls, I'm there. <laughs> you know, if Terrence calls, I'm there. Um, and um, so I've been getting so many great opportunities to do things like that. And then to play with people like Ambrose and Gerald and Walter and, and Logan and all of these people, those, that's like my love as well. So. 
I try to keep the everything in that triangle between those three things. Now, in that triangle, I tell my students sometimes, you might have to, might be a wedding right there. It's like, oh, let me do this wedding. You know <laughs> what I mean? You might want to endow your creativity in a different way, you know, uh-huh. but the main, uh, the main tenets of that triangle are the things that I'm concentrating on the most. And, and more and more throughout the the years I've been doing more of my own band, which I, which is so scary. We did our first, funny enough, we did our first tour of Europe. Um, and I'm so thankful that we got to do it right before COVID, you know? Um, right. um, so uh, it's building. I feel like it's building and, and uh, it's scary, but also uh, very encouraging. Well, you're certainly getting all these opportunities for good reason because you're a fantastic musician, fantastic composer. I find it very inspiring hearing you talk about your process and just even listening to this latest video that you're going to sh- that you've shared with us. It's um you know, it's 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 inspired me to think about writing some music today. So oh, thank great. you for, thank you for that. The TD Edmonton International Jazz Festival would like to thank Kendrick Scott for sharing such a wonderful performance and tribute with us today please visit edmontonjazz.com for more of your jazz online experiences.